Hi there. Welcome back at M2Meets. And today it's my great pleasure again to talk to Wendy Berg, one of the most well-known worldwide breast imagers for decades already, and the lead author is one of the most important uh, trials published in our field, JCO. And today we have a little bit more time to talk about details behind that study, personal experience, personal perspectives, and also very important, her wonderful initiative, Dense Best Info. So once again, Wendy, thanks for sharing your time with us. And let's start with a quick summary of your recent paper in JCO. Thank you for your interest. Um, so about 6,200 women had prospective multicenter screening with ultrasound performed by technologists using handheld technique and also had tomosynthesis. Um, and interestingly, unlike the Akron 6666 trial where physicians did the ultrasound and most women had not had tomosynthesis and the yield was about three to four per thousand, with ultrasound. In this study, we had only 1.3 cancers per thousand women on ultrasound in the first year and only one per thousand in years two and three. Um, much lower yields, suggesting that some of these cancers were seen on tomosynthesis um, that might not have been seen on the 2D mammogram. And also that uh, we found that there were a number of cancers, I think it was 23 altogether, that were actually biopsied using ultrasound guidance but had been missed initially by the technologists. So if you include those, the overall sensitivity of ultrasound was almost 60% compared to tomosynthesis was I think 68 or 69% in our study. Um, but the actual observed sensitivity of ultrasound was only 40%. So there were a number of cancers, probably mostly at the edges or rather deep in the breast, rather subtle of course, that were not seen uh, by the technologists at the time of the screening. And there were actually another nine cancers that were counted as detected, but where the technologists had only taken an image without actually measuring anything. So much like in the Akron trial, we required if they saw a simple cyst, just one image, but if it was other than a cyst, they had to take orthogonal views with and without calipers and add a Doppler image. And so we knew if they had really seen something they were concerned about that we would have the full set of pictures. But as I mentioned, there were nine cancers where they'd only taken an image uh, of the screen without any measurements and without orthogonal views, and it did prove to be a cancer. So clearly there, were, there was a learning curve here and clearly there were some technical issues. Um, you know, I think it's hoped that with automated technique, you would more fully cover the edges of the breast. So some of those cancers that were missed might have been detectable, uh, but we don't know that. And there's, of course, an interpretive error also with any of ultrasound, including the automated technique. No matter how you look at it, the yield of screening ultrasound is much lower than we saw or than we, than we all see with MRI. Um, this was true even in the initial Akron 6666 study, where we had a yield of nine cancers out of 612 women, or 15 per thousand with MRI, even after three rounds of screening with ultrasound and mammography. And of course, we know the results from the DENSE trial in the Netherlands were very favorable for women with extremely dense breasts, where MRI had a very substantial yield. Overall, these studies show about 16 cancers per thousand with MRI. Um, and the first year, and maybe an average of about seven cancers per thousand in subsequent years with MRI screening, much higher than the one per thousand that we see with ultrasound uh, in this study. And if you look across the literature with screening ultrasound, the yield is maybe two to three per thousand, uh, where many of those studies used physician-performed uh, screening ultrasound technique or automated technique. Wonderful. Uh, thank you, Wendy, for sharing these um, really deep insights into, into this, uh, the results and the stats. Uh, in a nutshell, um, what is the difference between the extremely dense population in your study and the ACRC? Is there any kind of fundamental difference? Because you mentioned the dense trial, which, as we all know, focused on the D category, if you wish. So any kind of trend or insights you would like to share with us here? So both in the Akron 6666 and also in, of course, the ECOG Akron 1141 trial that Chris Comstock and Christian Kuhl led, they had 
uh, most of the population had heterogeneously dense breasts and the mm -hmm. yield of MRI was every bit as good uh, in heterogeneously dense as in extremely dense breast women. Um, and so I think one of the big challenges that we have going forward we know that uh, in heterogeneously dense breasts, we miss at least 25% of cancers on mammography. And really it's probably more like 50% if you allow MRI as the gold standard. It's not adequate to do a mammogram alone, but this is a large population of women. Um, about 37% of American women have heterogeneously dense breasts. Um, that's a very large number of women to push for additional screening only somewhere between seven and 10% of women have extremely dense breasts. So it's easier to say, oh, across the board, we'll recommend MRI for the women who have extremely dense breasts because we can probably manage that in terms of capacity. Um, it's harder if we say all women with dense breasts at all, heterogeneously dense breasts or extremely dense breasts, if we recommend supplemental screening for all of those women, there's a capacity and access issue, and that's where the biggest challenge is. I think we all know that all of these women potentially could benefit from additional screening because there are cancers that we're missing on mammography, even with tomosynthesis. But we have a logistic challenge uh, in terms of providing them access to that supplemental screening. And ultrasound traditionally had been an alternative to MRI, not all women can tolerate MRI. Interestingly, in the original Akron trial, as well as the DENSE trial, about 41 to 42% of women, very similar numbers, didn't participate in the MRI, even though it was being offered to them at no out-of-pocket cost. And I think that speaks to that it's not well-tolerated. MRI is not always well-tolerated by all women. Claustrophobia was the biggest issue and continues to be a big issue for women in a recent survey that I did. Um, and so I think it is important to have an alternative. I think contrast enhanced mammography has a lot of potential in that regard. We're actually actively doing several screening trials of contrast enhanced mammography. And of course, there are other ongoing studies. CMIST is about to start in the United States, or has just started in the United States under Chris Comstock. And this is very important work because it provides an alternative to MRI that uses contrast that should show very similar benefits and similar uh, cancer detection rates to MRI, uh, but we need a little more data to really start using that in a, in a broader fashion. It's also something that probably can be done more cheaply and in more centers with less equipment purchase, and it's relatively simple to implement in terms of software upgrade. So I'm very optimistic that this will become an option. I'm less optimistic that ultrasound is gonna be the solution that we'd hoped for um, based on this recent uh, trial that we just published, um, but done well and in good hands, ultrasound can st still be very effective. Um, it is important to note that we had a very low interval cancer rate. So even though ultrasound didn't find as many cancers and even though uh, there were some still interval cancers. It was only 0.5 per thousand, which is very low um, and, and really quite respectable and suggests that the combination of tomosynthesis with ultrasound was effective. Um, it's just that it wasn't uh, as much of a yield as we had expected. Okay. Thank you for making that clear and also already discussing uh, what would be next. So obviously, uh, the results regarding ultrasound are, are rather clear. I mean, they, they never will be white and black, black and white, this is obvious because these are real life data. And also to, here, thank you for, for kind of discussing the aspects who are still open, but um, you already opened the window in the discussion of what, what could come next. Uh, thank you also for making clear that I think the, let's call it gold standard, whatever you will, is probably MR, but there are challenges um, in terms of patient's preference this is clear and you also mentioned uh, some studies which showed similar um, numbers we obviously have to see uh, how this translate after you know kicking off into into clinical practice uh, but obviously there's an alternative potential alternative uh, on on the road and here basically and this is contrast enhanced mammal but here one interesting momentum comes into the play enters the scene uh, and this is how to translate 
academic results, which are your JCO paper, the New England papers, into, into action. And this obviously involves um, public um, communication. Um, this uh, and obviously involves, uh, you know, public health, in your case, FDA and all these. But, but uh, one, I think, extremely important aspect is, is uh, talking to the patient, right? Uh, creating channels to the patients. And, and here, if you agree, I, I'd really love to, 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 to exchange uh, some thoughts and to learn from your perspective, because you are not only a, a great researcher, uh, you have contributed a lot of data to the to the community during the last three decades, if I may so. Um, uh, you, you, you discussed a lot of clinical work, but you also initiated a campaign called Dense Press Info to, I think, if I may summarize, um, translated basically the key knowledge into the, the patient's, uh, you know, waiting room and, and patient's, um, yeah, awareness. So what is the take home, your, your key, key take home to our listeners about Dense Press Info? Not everyone will know it already uh, in Europe. Point. So let us know about that. Thank you. No, so since 2015, I helped with Joanne Pushka and a patient advocate to start densebreastinfo.org, which was designed to provide information to directly to patients as well as to providers so that the woman, when she was informed of her breast density, that she would know what to do. And the challenge we have Starting in 2009, the first law passed in one of our states, Connecticut, to require some, some information about breast density be included in the results letter that the patient received with her mammogram results. There are now currently 38 states plus the District of Columbia that have some form of notification. Some of these letters would tell a woman she has dense breasts. Some of them just would say, Breast density is a challenge because it can hide cancers on the mammogram and it increases your risk of developing breast cancer, but they wouldn't actually tell the woman herself that she had dense breasts. And of course, some states had no laws at all, and so it wasn't necessary that they would get that result in their letter. Um, and so fortunately, after a lot of effort, and especially led by Joanne Pushkin and, and a few others, the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, just announced the new final rule that effective September 10th, 2024, all women in the United States will have to be notified in their mammogram results letter whether their breasts are dense or not dense. It will also include a statement telling the woman that breast density, dense breast tissue can hide cancers on the mammogram. And it will also suggest that uh, for women who have dense breasts, they will also be told that adding additional tests may improve detection of cancer. And there's specific language that has to be used. I'm not quoting it verbatim here, but uh, that will have to be in the letter. Mm -hmm. uh, a state or a facility can choose to add the specific density category. That is not required by the FDA. Um, the mammogram report, though, that goes to the doctor will now be required to include the BIRADS breast density, either fatty, scattered fibroglandular tissue, heterogeneously dense, or extremely dense. Those words will have to be in the report. It's been a recommendation, of course, for a long time, but it's not been required until this new rule takes effect. Um, and the nice thing here is that at least we will have a uniform standard for notification of women but it still begs the issue of translating that into practice and do the referring physicians have the tools and the knowledge that they need to have the conversations with the patient about what to do? I think probably not in general. That has been a limitation ever since the American Cancer Society in 2007 recommended MRI screening be added for women who are at very high risk, lifetime risk, more than 20 to 25 percent, or have known or suspected pathogenic mutations, uh, or had prior radiation treatment before age 30. Even translating that into practice has been very challenging because no one routinely, most centers don't routinely put the information into a risk model and calculate, oh, this person's lifetime risk is more than 20 percent. Um, and so that has been a real challenge. And uh, we have a paper that's actually being reviewed right now that 
suggest that many women actually meet that criterion with fairly simple uh, guidelines. And most women who have extremely dense breasts actually do meet that guideline already. Um, and so even without new standards from national organizations, they already meet that uh, recommendation. Women who have heterogeneously dense breasts and family history of breast cancer also usually meet that criterion at least up to age 55 or so. So if we can at least use those simple kind of back of the envelope guidelines, that will help. And um, there is a new law that is being proposed. It's currently a bill that's being put forth in Congress here called the Find It Early Act, which would require insurance coverage for all supplemental screening, as well as all diagnostic breast imaging. And that, of course, is a barrier right now um, in the United States because women do have to pay for supplemental screening or diagnostic recall for additional testing or if they have a lump. It's covered by insurance usually, but it is subject to a copay or deductible, which can be rather large amounts of money. Unlike Europe, where if it's a guideline, it's covered generally. Although I know in many countries in Europe, a woman still would have to pay out of pocket to get some of these additional screenings done as well. So I think that remains a barrier to address. And this would be tied to the National Comprehensive Cancer Network guidelines and the ACR, American College of Radiology, appropriateness criteria, so that as new technologies become proven and validated and appropriate to use for screening, the law would automatically update and cover that, if you will. And I think that's also necessary that we become more adept at uh, implementing new technologies earlier uh, so that maybe as we're implementing them, we're collecting the data on the outcomes rather than waiting for many long prospective multicenter trials before we even start doing it clinically. I think this has been one of the challenges is, again, how do you take what we know and start using it in practice um, with evidence collection while you're implementing it? I mean, I think that's really what we need. We're not going to have long-term trials of mortality reduction for new technologies. It's too expensive to do those studies. The technology changes quickly. It's, it is, requires that hundreds of thousands of women to do those studies and treatments are fairly effective now. So women don't die very quickly. And it's a, that's a good thing, but it makes it very hard to do those studies. But we do know that if we detect cancer early, women are going to do better. The treatment is less expensive. It's going to have much less adverse effect on their life. As you know, my own cancer was only found because I knew enough to seek a screening MRI, and it was found when it was less than a centimeter invasive, node negative, did not need any chemotherapy. And the point is that we want every woman to have the opportunity to have her cancer found early when it's easily treated. And that's really the goal of everything that we're doing. Thank you. This is, this is a wonderful perspective in the future. Uh, based on, I think, uh, fundamental knowledge uh, only few people have in that death over three decades. I think uh, one of the most beautiful moments uh, in, 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 in your summary, and this is only a brief summary because we could talk here for hours, is once you're setting up a trial, you always have to think, how could we use the most likely uh, endpoints? This is, a, this, is an, this is a mistake, at least I frequently witness, also in my own work, um, I mean, it's, it's like building a home, right? And once it's ready, you're wondering, okay, where are I going to put the furniture? And here and here, you once you're starting uh, traveling, you have to sort of calculate with an event. Otherwise, you do a 10-year trial, you publish it in a high-ranking journal, you get a lot of awards. But in the end, translating the trial into action, the data kind of fails because this was not, not included into the calculation, this is an extremely important point, and especially in, in breast cancer where, where, where treatment is changing so rapidly and quickly, this is extremely important. Yes, well, and the Pennsylvania Breast Cancer Coalition, which has helped support several of the studies that I've done, they have a slogan that the work that we're doing now is so that our daughters won't have to, basically. I, I would take that a step farther and say, it's so we won't have to, it's so that we won't have to endure 
late stage disease and late diagnosis and more aggressive treatments. If we can implement this technology that we know is effective now and start again, collecting outcomes and we can look at cost effectiveness as we go, but not doing that, we know we're harming women. If we don't start using the knowledge that we already have in practice, there are women every day who could have had their cancer found earlier with less aggressive treatment and a better outcome. And we really need to start pushing our governments, our people who make the guidelines and processes so that we can start deploying and making use of what we already know sooner uh, with, again, collection of evidence along the way is no problem. But don't wait. Don't wait. The enemy of good is perfect. We need to start doing it. And I'm so glad to see the new USOBI guideline last March that at least recommends MRI now for all women who have extremely dense breasts. Even if it's every two to four years, it's at least a lot better than not doing it. And again, the big issue that we need to tackle is women with heterogeneously dense breasts, women who are high risk, who don't even have dense breasts should also be getting MRI. But we need something better than the mammogram alone and for many women. And that's where education is so important, educating the patient. Dense Breast Info has a lot of information for patients. There's a European version of it that gets into individual country guidelines and practices that can help guide uh, a woman as well. I think over there, it's less common that a woman is told she has dense breasts. So it's a woman has to perhaps seek out that information more on her own. Um, and even here, it's only recently becoming more of a standard, but it is so important to understand that it can hide cancers. If you have dense breasts, the cancer can be missed on the mammogram. About 40% of cancers at least are hidden in dense breasts, and it also increases the risk of developing breast cancer, as you know, um, at least twofold higher risk in extremely dense breasts compared to scattered density. Um, and that's important also for a woman to understand and to advocate for herself. Beautiful. It couldn't be a more beautiful, concise final statement. So nothing for me to add, except to thank you, Wendy, for sharing your time, your most precious time with us. We traveled a long road from our scientific project, a statistical interpretation, and we put it into, you put it, not me, in a broad, broad perspective like a public perspective, right, involving all stakeholders. And most of all, in the center is always the patient, which we have to take care for. So thanks you once again, Wendy, for this long version of your interview with the USOBI social media platforms. And um, you at home, please make sure to follow us on all our channels, YouTube, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, not to miss any of our upcoming versions of M2Es. That's for us. That's for now. Thank you once again, Wendy, for being with us. Have a good one. Bye.